Great, thank you. Uh, good morning, everyone. Uh, th thank you to, to David for really doing my talk in a way. Um, he has you know, very well, very clearly demonstrated actually that there is a huge awareness amongst us all that we really do need to look at how we care for our patients and how we can actually do it a lot better. Um, I'd also like to thank him for basically calling me a technological Luddite with not understanding uh, uh, crowdsourcing or whatever. So it's a few questions here for, for everyone to, to look at. The first question is, do you have a means of data capture which allows you to easily obtain your colonoscopy sequel intubation rate? Very simple question. So you can see that in endoscopy, we're using data to very clearly look at the standards which JAG set us. So looking at the next question, do you have a means which allows you to easily measure your comfort score in colonoscopy? They're very simple, quick questions. Again, this is a slight no-brainer. The vast majority of people have the means of easily obtaining actually really important outcome data for our patients. And the final question I'm going to ask you, is your endoscopy GRS outcomes part of your annual appraisal documentation? Do we use this data to show what we're doing and how we are, are caring for our patients? So not quite as obvious as I would have thought, but about 80% of people are using this data to demonstrate to their appraisers about the, the quality of care that they're delivering to patients. So why do we do this? You know, when this document goes, the paper was published about 10 years ago now, before the bowel cancer screening program came along, which actually pointed out that we may or may not have been doing colonoscopy um, adequately. And out of that came the GRS, uh, came, came the JAG uh, program, and GRS was a, an electronic means of capturing that data to show how well or how or where there was room for improvement. So in endoscopy, we are using data to drive the quality of the care that we deliver to patients. So we're doing this already. What about an IBD? Well, we have the standards. Um, sorry, David, I've got the Crohn's and Colitis UK old symbol on it. Um, but in, 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 in IBD, we have the standards. We have the equivalent of JAG setting those standards. Uh, David has already talked about NICE and saying actually there are some standards from NICE. And I think David's already talked about this document. Our patients are going to be coming to us and saying actually, how, what does your service look like? Why is, where is the room from, for improvement? How can we help you do this? We have the audit as a means of benchmarking our data and our services. It has its strengths and its weaknesses. It's been a huge driver for improving the quality of care. But equally, most of the data is collected retrospectively. We all know that. Um, if you look at when patients get entered into the audit, there's a huge rise just before the deadline. Isn't that right, Amy? Um, so we all know that it's probably more retrospective than we like to, like to uh, admit to. When NICE, um, you know, David's already shown this slide, but in some ways these are slightly unambitious targets. If you look at statement four, patients receiving drug treatments for IBD are monitored for adverse effects. So, again, three very simple questions. Do you have a system for identifying patients who have been on steroids for more than three months? Okay, so it's a bit like the sequel intubation rate, isn't it, except the other way around. So the next question, do you have a robust system for immunomodulator monitoring? So it's better, we're doing a bit better with this, but again, it's 50-50. Not great if you think about this as part of our nice uh, mandated quality. And finally, do you have a robust system for initiating and monitoring patients on biologics? So we're doing a bit better on this one, which is, which is good news, but there's still 30% of people who say, actually, we don't have a handle on what we're doing with our, with our patients on biologics. And this is really important for our commissioners moving forward and how we run our services. So this is a, a slide will get, make sense in a minute once we've seen all of it. So at the moment, the way that we use data, we record it when we see our patients, we write it down on a bit of paper, 
and essentially that data is useless, I would suggest to you. First of all, no one else can read it, apart from the person who's written it probably. Secondly, it's written in an unstructured way. We, sort of, we write down patient fine or whatever, that's meaningless. It means nothing to anyone coming back again. We're not using uh, proper scoring systems. Essentially, that data is useless other than a record of the patient actually being in the clinic. So what about a different way of recording how we see our patients? What about using a patient management system or a web tool or another way of recording this data where we're recording data in a structured way, we're using proper disease activity scoring systems, we're thinking about what the problems are for our patients, um, we're producing uh, outcomes for our patients at the time so that they can leave the clinic with a record of that consultation, what medications you th they think they're on, but actually, there's a lot more that that data can then be used for because you're recording it in a structured way. I think the really important thing about this slide is actually in the middle. By recording that data, you can use it locally for developing your service, for planning your service. You can use it to improve your patient uh, experience. You can use it for audit, service management, quality improvement. One of the things that came up on David's slide was there's a great awareness that accreditation is coming, revalidation. We can use revalidation <coughs> in our, uh, use it for our revalidation purposes personally. Um, we can use it for informing our patients. We're going to hear from Chris later on, but there are a number of other projects saying actually patients will be getting access to our, their own data and their own information very soon. We have got to record it in a way that is useful to our patients and they can use it to self-manage. We'll hear from Chris a lot more about that. And finally, what about research? You know, we've, if you look at things like the Jet Aid project, how successful they have been. Keith is going to talk about some, uh, some opportunities that are arising very soon, thanks to Crohn's and Colitis UK. But what about our managers? We go to our managers, basic question. So Fraser, how many patients does your IBD service look after? Slightly embarrassing that I can't tell them at the moment. You know, it doesn't look, put us on our front foot. And finally, our commissioners with biologics is very much on their agenda at the moment. They're going to see a big rise in our use of biologics with the NICE ruling on, on ulcerative colitis. They want the reassurance that we're going to use the drugs properly, cost effectively, and in the right patients. Why aren't we collecting that data when we see the patients? So, as I've said, all of this hinges around actually collecting the data when we see the patients. It's quite a big challenge to us. We're all used to using pens and paper. We're all used to, that's what we feel comfortable with. It actually really challenges the way that we care for our patients and our consultation with patients. The registry has developed a number of tools which will uh, help us do this. There's the patient management system some of you will be using already. Matt, has, Matt Johnson has been a great proponent of this and has really got it integrated into every aspect of his clinical service. The web, the web tool is going to be a web-based tool which uh, will allow uh, any hospital in, in the UK eventually, hopefully in the next few months, to, to be able to con contribute to the registry and to start to use data in a very different way. There's, another of other, and there's a number of other systems that are already in use, such as the Ascribe system, the Rotherham system, and one or two other, other systems around which will be able to interact with the registry. So what, what would we expect? What, what, what benefit can clinical teams get from putting data in in this way? If you think about you pick up a, you see a patient, the first thing you do is pick up a set of case notes and you spend five minutes finding out about that patient. Um, all of that information will be recorded in front of you in terms of the patient summary. Um, other functions that will come through are things like running your MDT, uh, flare line support, your nurses are really important in all of this, giving them the information that they need to run a flare line, for example, is really, really important for them. Drug monitoring, cancer surveillance, uh, what about osteoporosis, often neglected, but something really important. Um, communication with our GPs and with our patients, and also thinking about other ways of how we follow our patients up virtual clinics, um, telephone clinics, things like this are all really important in terms of effectively using our resources moving forward. So does, actually, does this using data in a different way actually make a difference to our patients? 
So the Improved Care NAR project is run in the United States. It's quite expensive, to put, it, to put it mildly. But in terms of actually improving patient outcomes, just by actually recording what's happening to your patients, you can actually manage them better. You can see that in the top, uh, in the top corner there, the remission rates in ulcerative colitis improve. Steroid-free remission improves. Patients are in a, have a more sustained uh, remission of UC, and they're off steroids for longer. All of this comes about by just recording your data in a structured way so that you're able to actually identify the patients who perhaps are on steroids for longer than they should be, and then you're able to intervene and, imp and uh, improve the outcomes for patients. This is a pediatric population rather than adult, but I think the, the, the basis uh, it holds true. Um, a project that we're running at the moment is uh, looking at anemia in IBD. Um, just trying to get a, it's really a pilot project, just trying to determine the level of service and treatment of patients with respect to iron deficiency. Um, I'm hoping that this will be a, will inform perhaps uh, the next round of the audit in a way and the questions that we can ask with that. Very simple study, but hopefully is a demonstration of a little bit of research, but also will impact into uh, patient care moving forward. So a few questions. How do you use data to care for your patients? Can it, could you use it better to improve your patient outcomes, the quality of your patient care, to develop your service? And what about research? And something that is, our patients really want us to take part in research. They want that opportunity. We need to get the data and the information on our patients to facilitate this. There are many barriers to this. Some of them we can manage, some of them are ourselves, the challenge of how we, how we care for our patients, how we use data. There are other barriers, such as hospital IT departments, which are, take a little bit more work, but uh, nonetheless are surmountable. And I'd, uh, Stuart mentioned the, the website to have a look at that later on. So I'm going to hand over to Umar now to talk about the, um, the pouch registry. So thank you. Thanks, Fraser. So next up is, again, many of you will be familiar with Omar, who's consultant colorectal surgeon um, at St. Mark's, but also is the chair of the pouch registry and chairman of the IBD subcommittee of the ACPGBI. Thanks, Omar. Thank you. So I thought my remit was a little bit broader than that to speak about clinical information and how it can improve future IBD care and outcomes and to give you some surgical examples of it. Now, 20 years ago when I qualified, or just over 20 years ago, clinical information looked somewhat like that. Today, it looks different. We've gone digital. We now have administrative data sets that encompass all of England, so you can actually find out about any patient admission anywhere in the country. We can take those data sets and we can link to them clinically relevant information in the form of registry data. Now, these are enormous data repositories from which we can actually sort of carve out outcome metrics, and those outcome metrics can then help us drive quality. Now, the origins of outcome measurement are actually traceable back to Florence Nightingale, who after the uh, Crimean War came back to the UK and teamed up with William Farr, one of the leading epidemiologists of the time. Now, together, they set about investigating the uh, uh, high mortality rates at some civilian hospitals in England actually identified through audit that actually the poorest hospitals were in areas of uh, poor sanitation. And through public health measures to improve sanitation, Florence Nightingale managed to actually halve the hospital mortality rate across English hospitals during her lifetime. Now, we live in the era of public reporting. It's actually over two decades ago that cardiac surgeons in New York were subjected to the first public reporting of their individualized mortality rates. It wasn't followed up with any particular public health interventions after that, but even so, there was a 40% reduction in mortality with this type of surgery in New York State in the four years that followed that. You see, putting data out there isn't just passive, it's dynamic. Something happens when you put data out. Thomas Monson says that when performance is measured, performance improves. When performance is measured and reported, the rate of performance accelerates. 
It's worth us bearing in mind how policymakers actually go about using some of the big data that we've actually got available to improve standards in healthcare and how they're doing it at the moment. Well, the first thorny question is about centralisation of care. Big data is actually very good for getting from that activity and volume levels. Now, I showed some of these slides yesterday, but it's to make the same point. This is John Berkmeyer's paper from 10 years ago. It really defined the volume outcome relationship in surgery. Effectively, the more of a complex operation that we actually do in a hospital, the greater the likelihood of a good outcome. Now, that's been shown in various different contexts, in various different countries and surgical specialties. We uh, demonstrated this phenomenon in uh, pouch surgery in England, and we reported on it five years ago. We demonstrated that high volume pouch uh, institutions uh, offered favourable outcome when you look at pouch survival when compared to medium volume and low volume providers. I mentioned yesterday I've got concerns about the, uh, the volume outcome relationship when it's taken at its very simplistic level because whatever you do, if you work your way to the right hand side of that funnel plot, you can see extremes of performance, both positive and negative outliers for performance. So you've still got poor performers at high volume. So if you take blind, random uh, centralization of services and push volume around indiscriminately, you're not necessarily going to get any difference in outcome. So the buzzword in public health at the moment is selective referral. You use big data to identify who seems to do it well, and then you steer volume towards those providers. And when you actually look at what's happened with the availability of data from the information center and actually the formation of clinical commissioning groups, it looks like we're being lined up for selective referral in the UK. What about quality improvement programs? Well, I've used here Atul Gawande as my uh, poster boy. Uh, many of you will know his, his text, but he was also the surgical lead for the WHO surgical safety checklist that we all use before our operations these days. But quality improvement programs essentially come down to using big data to identify poor performers, so the people that aren't doing particularly well, and then through evidence-based interventions, helping them to actually improve and come back down into the fold. Now, one of the most important quality improvement programs in surgery is the American College of Surgeons uh, National Surgical Quality Improvement Program. Now, this was initiated through the ACS, but it's actually been rolled out in over 200 veterans affairs institutions in the United States. And what happens is that each of those institutions has a team of dedicated nursing staff who just pick up clinical uh, information from the notes and send it centrally for amalgamation. And then the central office come back to the uh, provider institutions with caterpillar plots like this. I've shown one here for 30-day mortality. And so on the right-hand side, in pink, you've got the institutions that are high mortality outliers. And on the left-hand side, you've got the institutions in green that are low mortality outliers. Now, there are already lots of examples from Nesquip about uh, uh, quality improvement, that actually sending this information out, particularly to the poorer providers, and alongside that, not just telling them that they're poor providers, but sending them information on uh, evidence-based protocols to help them, uh, as well as examples of good uh, practice from the high-performing hospitals, has actually demonstrated massive impacts in ter terms of uh, surgical site infection and length of stay. The problem is, it's quite expensive, and what's actually very cheap, albeit a bit aggressive, is actual individual clinician reporting. So much akin to what went on in uh, the state of New York 20 years ago, well two years ago, as colorectal surgeons, for the first time, we were subjected to 90-day elective mortality reporting following our colorectal cancer uh, resections. You can take it straight from the medical director of the NHS, who's also a cardiac surgeon him, uh, himself, that if you can't describe what you're doing and define how well you're doing it, you have no right to be doing it at all. Now, that sort of data reporting is mandatory, but most of our registries are actually voluntary. So with that in mind, in 2011, we relaunched the ILEAL pouch registry. And the plan here was to improve standards in pouch surgery through a process of continuous national audit of activity and outcome. 
We've now actually accumulated over 3,000 uh, pouch procedures on the pouch registry, and that's actually giving us very important information regarding the patients that are actually coming to pouch surgery. But even more importantly, it's actually giving us national benchmarks of outcome in this particularly complex area of care. The problem we have with any voluntary register is that sometimes it feels that we're only actually measuring the observable tip of the iceberg, and we can't actually see what's going on uh, beneath the surface. You see, the problem is, is that asking clinicians for their data to report is challenging, and it's going to be, feel invasive, and for some of our colleagues, it evokes denial, and in others, defiance. So to summarise, what I've tried to actually uh, describe is how administrative data resources and clinical registries are now being used and they're being linked to derive outcome metrics. And some of these are providing national benchmarks which are going to provide the tools through which we can actually drive performance upwards. Thank you. Thanks, Omar. I think we'll just take questions at the end if that's okay.